Hi, everyone. I'm here this evening to give you some hope, okay? The Bible says that we are waiting the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that is the hope, the blessed hope of every Christian, every man or woman of God. Listen, you don't have to fear the age we're living in. There's no, no need to uh, be frightened and timid and, and intimidated by the, the wiles of the devil. Uh, in this last day. We're living for God. Those of us who are Christians, we win in the end. But it's good to know uh, what is happening in the world. Last week, I got into a lot of things talking about um, the Antichrist, talking about the Great Tribulation, talking about the rapture of the church. And I believe the rapture is the very next event on God's timetable worldwide. And in fact, the, the rapture is imminent. There are no uh, uh, prophecies that need to be fulfilled. They've all been fulfilled. All is in waiting. Everything's ready. Jesus Christ is coming again. He told his disciples over 20 times. He mentioned his second coming, and he wants us to, to pay attention, uh, wake up, and, and uh, pay notice to his words because he's coming soon. And that is our hope. That's the joy of the, of the Christian life, that, that this, this life is not all there is. God's got a life for us that far exceeds anything we can even think or imagine. He's prepared for those who love him. So we'll talk about that in the next few moments. Right now we're going to take a, a time of worship and singing. And I pray that the music and um, the, the melody, the worship song will just bless your heart. I want you to sing along with us, if you will. Take a moment and share this video with someone. Let someone know uh, what we're talking about. Tonight we're talking about the Antichrist. And so we really want to get into it. We want to get as much any facts out there as possible uh, so that you can have hope and you can be instructed. You can know what the future holds. So let someone know. Would you do that? Contact someone. Text them or call them up right now and just say, hey, you've got to watch this. It's going to be good. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray your blessing, Lord, over this video, over the teaching uh, that I will be doing. May every heart be open and receptive. Lord, we pray that now in the next three or four minutes as we sing this song, uh, may our May our hearts just be uh, melted before you. May your spirit come and, and abide with us. Do wonderful things in us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And Shall ever 
Bible declares that the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Now, John, the apostle, penned those words almost 2,000 years ago. The spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world, already with us, always has been with us. Ever since Satan, as Lucifer, fell from heaven to earth and uh, came against Adam and Eve in the garden and deceived them into giving up um, their legal rightful ownership of the planet. And um, in that particular time, that particular moment, um, Satan became the ruler of this world. He became the, the god of this world, small g, god of this world. Um, <clears throat> okay. Spirit of Antichrist, that's it. Couldn't remember what I was talking about. That's terrible. All right, it's all right, you guys. One of these days you'll be this old. <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. The Apostle John wrote almost 2,000 years ago that the spirit of the Antichrist is with us, already here uh, in this social order, on this planet, the spirit of Antichrist. And he said, now what is the spirit of Antichrist? Well, anti means opposed to, in opposition, but it also means in the place of. And so uh, Satan has attempted to subjugate um, the mankind and, and, and cause him to fall, cause him to worship uh, something other than the true and living God, Jehovah Elohim. And he has done everything in his power to thwart the bloodline, to... Um, stop the Messiah from coming, and he, he has never won, he's never been victorious. Jesus came to the earth, he died for the sins of mankind, and when Satan uh, empowered these men to put Jesus on the cross, little did he know that that was the greatest thing that could have happened, because the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus took the curse of sin for every man, every woman, every boy and girl on the planet, and uh, by doing so, he paid the supreme price. Now salvation is available through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So what Satan meant for evil, God meant it for good. He turned it around, and salvation has been won. Now this spirit of Antichrist, it, it's been in the earth now all this time, ever since uh, Lucifer, who's Satan, fell from heaven and uh, took a third of the angels of heaven with him, according to Revelation chapter 12. And he began immediately this campaign of, of um, discrediting God, causing man to, to turn his attention from the true and living God and his worship of Jehovah Elohim to, uh, to anything else. See, Satan doesn't, doesn't matter to him what you worship, just so you don't worship God, just so you don't worship Yahweh. And so, so he attempted to get man to turn his attention from God and the spirit of Antichrist, we've seen it in the earth, we've seen... Uh, men rise up like Hitler and, and Mussolini and uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and, and uh, these, these men like uh, Mao Zedong and these guys like jo Joseph Stalin. Throughout history, they've arisen and they've tried to rule the world and um, the spirit of Antichrist has been in, at work in these uh, men, through these men. But there's coming a day when there will be one who, who we will know of as the Antichrist, one man. And this man will attempt to rule the world. He will establish a one world government. All the governments and, and nations and kingdoms of the world will be subject to him. Uh, all of the economic uh, factors of society will be in, uh, in, in, in honor of him and he will, he will uh, cause, cause all of the, the men and women not to be able to buy and sell, for instance. And so he'll also have the religions of the world under his control, under his power. So one man will rule the world. That's a scary thought. But you know, that, that, uh, that thought of, um, of one man ruling the world has been with us for a long time. For instance, globalist and trilateral commission members for years, for decades, have talked about a new world order. They've talked about a man who could come and, and lead us. For instance, David Rockefeller, who's, uh, whose billions of dollars have helped to fund the globalist movement, and uh, in the world, he, he said, and I quote, all we need is the right major crisis, and the nations 
will accept the new world order. All we need is the right crisis, a major crisis, a pandemic, perhaps, a global pandemic. will cause men to be subject to government, and government will tell them if they can go to church or not. Government will tell them if they can go to work or not. The government will control the schools, whether children attend schools or not. Uh, the government shall control every aspect of their lives. And I'm going to tell you, as we look around at this, this pandemic, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, you can see how easy it would be for one group of people to absolutely rule the world. It just takes a major crisis, Rockefeller said. Another gentleman, in 19, as far back as 1957, um, the leader of NATO, Paul Henry Spack, he said these words, and I quote, what we want... NATO, okay, the North American Treaty Organization, all these nations of the world, what we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold alliances of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he a god or a devil, we will receive him. Now, I don't know if Mr. Spock realized just how prophetic his words are, but there will be a man... And he's not going to be of God, he's going to be of the devil. And yes, the world will receive him. Now, when, when uh, the, the uh, Antichrist appears in the Old Testament, the book of Revelation, he's riding a white horse. He's the rider of the white horse. Some have confused that with, with Jesus, because Jesus rides on a white horse. But you have to see what follows the appearance of the rider. For instance, the appearance of this rider is not a kingdom of righteousness, but a time of wickedness and sorrow. Masquerading as the true Messiah, he wears a crown, while Jesus, according to Revelation 19 and 12, wears many crowns. In the Greek translation, the crown worn by the rider of the white horse refers to a crown of victory that a conqueror would wear. The crowns Jesus wears in Revelation 19 refer to crowns of royalty because he is king of kings. He is lord of lords. When a victor triumphantly enter, enters into a newly conquered kingdom, he would invariably ride a white horse. The Antichrist will deceitfully establish himself in the earth, and then he will show his true colors. This coming world leader, this Antichrist, will come at an economically difficult time. There will be war in different parts of the world. And he, through brilliant political moves, along with an incredible charisma. He will be able to do what no one else has ever done, bring economic stability to the world and bring world peace. And by establishing this peace, he will deceive many. He will even convince the Jewish nation, the, 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 the Israelis and the Arab nations to sign a peace treaty, very similar to the one that was signed just a few weeks ago uh, by Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Very similar, similar to the one uh, about two or three months ago that was signed by Israel, and we're still waiting to see if the Palestinians are going to sign um, that particular peace deal. It, was a tremendous, it would be a tremendous benefit to um, the, the Arab people, the Palestinians, but they, they don't want peace. They obviously want to eradicate Israel. They won't recognize Israel as a state, as a nation, as a people. They want to destroy Israel. They want to push Israel off of the map into the ocean. And so they're not going to sign a peace deal until the Antichrist comes. And somehow, uh, because the rapture of the church has taken place, and the earth will be in such incredible turmoil and upheaval uh, financially and militarily and uh, because of disease and pandemics and so forth, because of all that, the Antichrist will rise and the nations of the world will follow him. Remember the words of, of those two men, all we need is the right major crisis, said Rockefeller, and the nations will accept the new world order. And this fellow named Paul Henry Spock said, send us a man and be he a god or devil, we will receive him. Oh, how chilling those words are to me. It doesn't matter if he's a god or a man, we will receive him. doesn't matter. We'll, you send us a man. We, once we see that man and hear that man speak, and we recognize he's capable of leading us out of this mess that we're in, we will, we will follow him. We will follow one world leader. 
he's not only going to convince the Jewish and Arab nations to sign a peace treaty, this Antichrist, but he will, it will pave the way for a long-awaited third temple. The Jewish people have been preparing to rebuild the temple now for a long time. I was in Israel in 1996, and um, our guide took us to a, a, uh, a museum. And uh, <clears throat> it, actually, in the museum, they had the, the artifacts that will be used in the temple. And uh, these folks are preparing for temple worship. They're, they're training the priests in how to offer sacrifices. They are they're raising uh, their own herd of heifers, red heifers, because that ashes of a red heifer is part of the sacrificial duty of the priests. They've rebuilt the, uh, the candlesticks according to God's instruction to Moses in the book of Exodus. They've re rebuilt the, the, uh, the big laver. They've rebuilt the table of showbread. All the things... Necessary. The only thing missing is the Ark of the Covenant. And um, so, you know, we're not sure where the Ark is. Some people think the Ark is directly underneath the Temple Mount. Some people think the Ark is in Ethiopia. The Ark is, you know, somewhere else. And folks, ladies and gentlemen, it really doesn't matter where that Ark is because that Ark is only a type of the true Ark of the Covenant, which is in heaven. John saw that ark in the heavens, and that's where it is now, the, the true ark. And what we had on the earth was just man's um, building that, a representation of the true, that the spirit and presence of God would abide in. But we don't need that ark anymore because we as new covenant believers have the spirit of Christ in us. If, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So we have the Holy Spirit within we have the presence of God every single day. We don't have to go to a temple. We don't have to go to a tabernacle. We don't have to carry out a whole long list of things that, that, we, can, that we do to please God and, and somehow merit his favor. He's already given us favor through the Lord Jesus. He's given us his grace, and he has made us his own children. He's adopted us into his family, those of us who are born again, who are children of God. What a wonderful thought that is. So... So then the, the Antichrist will uh, enable the rebuilding of the third temple. I believe the monies are already there. I believe this, there's been that adequate money donated to build the temple. And they're just simply waiting for a way to build it somehow around the, the, the mosque of, of Omar, the Dome of the Rock. When you look at a picture of, of Jerusalem, one of the first things you see is this big, beautiful golden dome. And you think, oh, hi, how pretty that is. That's beautiful. It must be a a Christian church, a Christian symbol. No, that is a Muslim mosque. That is the Dome of the Rock. There's a rock inside there that men and women come and bow to and revere and almost worship because they teach that Muhammad launched from that rock into heaven. So they've built this mosque and they've covered it with, with gold plating and it's just it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, but it, there's no life there. It's not uh, empowered by the Spirit of God. I you know, and so and so that has to go. That I don't know what what's going to happen. I don't know if the earthquake's going to take it out, or if somebody's going to blow it up, or if the Jews and Arabs are going to come to an agreement that they can build the temple right next door to the mosque. I don't know. We'll, we'll wait and see. But the plan is the third temple will be rebuilt, and it will be built in time for this antichrist, this man of sin, this lawless one, to enter into and try to establish himself as uh, the true and living God. He wants to take the place of Jesus. That's what an antichrist does. He's opposed to Christ. He wants to take the place of Christ. He wants the worship of mankind to come to himself. And uh, to that end, he will, he will not stop at anything necessary. He will become a very evil man. In fact, he will be history's vilest embodiment of sin and rebellion. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, the day of the Lord, the second coming, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness and sin is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Now, I personally think that um, this man of sin and rebellion, this antichrist, is already alive in the world somewhere. I believe he's already an adult. I don't think he's a child. I don't think he is yet to be born. 
I believe we're that close to the end of, end of days that, that he's already a, a man. He's already a, perhaps in politics. Maybe he's royalty. I don't know. But he's, he's leading somewhere. He's going to come out of the revised Roman Empire, what is now uh, known as the, as the European Union. It will be the, the, all of the, the nation states that made up Rome will all be revised and he will come from there, somewhere in Europe. And so he will come and uh, uh, I, I believe that he won't be revealed, truly revealed as the Antichrist until after the rapture. I believe the rapture is first and then when we're gone, okay, like I told our congregation Sunday morning, two billion people, perhaps as many as two billion are born again on the earth today. I mean, really, sincerely, children of God. I don't mean members of a church. I don't mean shaking a preacher's hand. I, I don't mean being baptized or dunked or sprinkled. I mean truly born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's the way you enter to the kingdom of God. The only way you can enter is be by being born again. So let's say, for instance, that are, there are two billion of, of us on the planet. At the moment of the rapture, the trumpet sounds and there's a voice from heaven that shouts and uh, the dead in Christ, those who've died in the Lord, are going to rise first. Their old decayed bodies will become glorified new bodies. Their spirit will be reunited with their body and they shall begin to ascend. They will be caught up. That's what the word, word rapture means, to snatch away or to catch up. And uh, so, so they will be, they'll rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now, I can't fly, I can't uh, defy gravity in this body, but I'm going to receive a glorified body, like the, like the Lord Jesus' body. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that we don't know uh, what, what, what all's going to be. We don't have all the answers, but we do know this. John said this, he said, the Apostle John, he said this, when he appears, we shall be like him. We should be like him. Um, Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, we shall be changed. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. The dead and the living will be changed in an instant of time. In a flash, the corruptible will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immortality. And we, man, and we shall be changed. We'll be changed in these bodies that will be all whole and new and, and restored and glorified. These bodies and spirits reunited will just soar to the heavens and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Nothing can ever take us from his hand at that point, ever. We're with the Lord for eternity, for eternity. Think about that. Now, that should give every Christian hope. I, you know, Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with the fact that this earth is not your final destination, but there's a rapture, a catching away, a snatching up of the, of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, who's made herself ready, who's without spot or wrinkle in God's eyes. And he's going to catch us up and take us to be with him. What a glorious thought that is, to know that, that, that we can take hope in that, we can take comfort in that. Now, if you're listening to me and that doesn't, comfort you, that it scares you and, and terrifies you, the thought that that's going to happen, the end of the world is coming. Listen, you, that means, that tells me you're not right with God. If you're right with God, then you're looking up, you're waiting for your redemption to draw nigh. You're, you're excited about his second coming. You're saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come, please. Take us out of here. And, uh, but if you're not comforted by those words, let me just encourage you to get on your knees uh, Wherever you are, stand, sit, doesn't really matter. But call upon God with your own words, with your own heart. Reach out to the God who loves you and cares for you and sent his own son to die in your place. Reach out to this God and let him change you. Let the new birth take place inside of you and you'll never be the same. You will become a new creature in Christ. Uh, a species of being that's never existed before. Wow. Wow. Think about that for a moment, would you? A new species of being. It's never existed. That's what the new birth is, the new creation, the new covenant. God is all about new things. Behold, I'm doing a new thing, he says. 
He's doing a new thing in our hearts, doing a new thing in our lives. He's going to do a new thing in this planet. When the rapture occurs, we go to heaven. The tribulation, the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. Then he comes again in the clouds of glory. We return with him. He establishes his throne for a thousand years, a millennial reign, a thousand years of peace. We'll turn our swords into plowshares, Isaiah said, and we will practice war no more. The lion will lay down with the lamb. It's going to be an incredible place. No more thorns and thistles and all the curse that was on the earth. All that's going to be done away with during this thousand years of peace. And then when that's concluded, God's intent is to destroy this planet and this heavens, heavens and earth, not by water this time, but it's going to destroy it by fire. He's going to purge it. He's going to, he's going to clean it up, and he's going to make it new. He's going to start over with a new uh, paradise. You and I will be in that paradise with the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. What a glorious thought that, that is. But now we're, we're seeing some of the things falling into place. And it's exciting. It really it is. I, I, I can't believe that we're this close to the coming of the Lord Jesus in my lifetime, in your lifetime. And so we're talking about the Antichrist with these incredible accomplishments and uh, spectacular things he's going to do. He's going to actually, he will suffer a mortal wound to his head. He will be killed, but the Bible says he will raise from the dead. Wow. What a miracle. Oh yeah. Satan is capable of of signs and wonders of his own, and that's exactly what this is going to be. Of course, this is going to deceive so many people. They're going to say, oh, he must be the Messiah. He died and rose again after three days. You know, they, they don't even realize that's already, already happened. The true Messiah did that 2,000 years ago, but they're going to continue to follow this man of sin. They will hail him as the Messiah. They will build the third temple. They will start uh, making uh, sacrifices. The priest, as I told you, they're already studying how to do this. They will make sacrifices. People will come into the, into the temple in Jerusalem and have the priest offer sacrifice for them in this temple. But be warned, be forewarned, the, the, the man of sin, this Antichrist, is a deceiver. He will be history's vilest embodiment of sin and rebellion. As Paul said, don't let anyone deceive you. The rebellion is going to occur and the man of lawlessness is revealed He's the man doomed to destruction. And uh, he goes on in the, that same chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. He, he writes, Then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the brightness of his coming. Now, lawless can be translated wicked. The Antichrist totally opposes every law of God, every one of them. Every law. You name God's law, you name one, one law of God's, and the Antichrist will oppose it. He's, he's in opposition to it. He wants to take the place of it. He wants the worship of mankind directed to himself. So Satan is establishing then a, an unholy trinity. See, everything God does, Satan has a counterfeit. And so this unholy trinity is Satan takes the place of God. He wants everyone to worship him. He empowers the beast or the Antichrist. He, he's trying to take the place of the son Jesus. And then there's this guy we call the false prophet. He will be the religious leader of the world. Not a Christian or he would have gone in the rapture, but the religious leader of the world. And he will attempt to take the place of the Holy Spirit by lifting up the, the beast and promoting him and causing all to worship him, causing all to take his mark and so forth and so on. And so... He's a lawless man. He is a man of, of, of wickedness, a man of rebellion. And um, we, we need to just be on guard and, and be praying about our lives, our family. Make sure you're right with God. And that, my friend, is what's so important. Well, I see my time has gone for this particular session. So I'm going to bring it to a close and I'm going to lead uh, in prayer uh, this, this uh, particular time. And wherever you are, uh, whatever time of week that you're listening to this message, would you just take a moment now and pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we commit these words to you. We pray, Lord, for every home that's uh, receiving this message. We pray for every individual, every family represented here, Lord. May there be peace in homes. May there be harmony in marriages. Lord, I pray you would stir the hearts of your people in this last day. May we not grow cold and indifferent. May we not 
grow uh, out of fellowship with you, but, but, but even the more as we see the day approaching, Lord, we want to assemble ourselves together. We want to be faithful to a local church. We want to be faithful to tithe. We want to make these our priorities, God, to witness and to share with our family. May we set these as priorities in our lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.
Amen. Well, that's it for this time. Uh, Join us uh, Sundays, if you possibly can, at 10 a.m. at Life Community Church. We're located at 3700 West, excuse me, 3700 Prepaid Way in Ada. And uh, real simple, real easy to find, 10 o'clock Sundays. And we'll be bringing you uh, the next uh, installment of this teaching next week on uh, on the connection at 630 Wednesday. All right, God bless you. Have, Have a great day, everybody.